and share the screen and silence the people. And there they come, the people. Okay, so uh, I've got about 10 minutes before the official class time. Oh, I should mention uh, scheduling issues. So today is the 13th and we are here. So, so today we're starting chapter eight and projects nine and 10 are due, 11 and 12 next week and then a week off. There are some special events coming up. Um, a week from today, I'm going to do the same Android thing I did in this class for the Cyber Club, so people may bring phones to test things. We will see how that works out. And then um, I'll have the red versus blue the Saturday after that, which will be a competition available to everybody. Not very complex or difficult, but um, should only take an hour or two. And um, the, a lot of people are very interested in this. They're much, much easier than the big fancy competitions with the Golden Cups, just something that's a little bit more fun than ordinary homework is my only goal here but um, should be accessible to beginners and everybody else is the idea. And let's take a look at the news. I did see a lot of exciting news today. Um, and this is kind of amusing. Um, and actually they're all pretty good. Um, yeah. And this one was pretty exciting. And so is that one. All right, so here's a few to mention. Um, Caitlin just showed me this, and I looked it up. It's real. Uh, radio, emergency medical people use unencrypted radio. So you can just totally pick it up. This is um, apparently well-known, and everybody says they're going to get around someday to improving the hardware, and everybody's been doing this. They're sending your identities of patients, their medical problems, private information for unencrypted radio uh, from hospitals. And apparently this is just normal and nobody cares. Various people find it every now and then and get all excited and they say, oh no, no everyone's used to that. It doesn't matter. And I'm like, oh, I don't think it matters. So I remember a few years ago, they used to have um, cabbies would just read your credit card number over unencrypted ham radio. So uh, I wonder about it. But anyway, I do know, I know another one I saw at Hope about five years ago was a guy that wanted to check the police encrypted radio. Police have encrypted walkie-talkies, and he got a book. He got well, one of the classic books in, in How to Break Encryption, and chapter one of the book says, "Be first check for plain text. So he looked, and a bunch of it was just unencrypted. And then he found out that they don't work very well. The police radio has like a dial to dial in the private key, and the law says you have to change the private key every month, and somehow it is very hard to operate. So if you have a basket of 20 radios and dial them like, Five of them are wrong and don't work. So the cops learn quickly that you just turn that encryption off because it just ruins everything and they use them without encryption. <laughs> and uh, this, by the way, is like the password changing regulations that the NSA recommended that everyone had. By making people change their password every month, all you do is drive them nuts and now they write it on their monitor on the keyboard or something and you go, well, much worse than you would have been just letting them leave it the same. But uh, by irritating people with stupid privacy rules you or security rules, you undermine the whole thing. So um, I'm amazed at people getting upset about this. So there's the, the official requirement for the certificate number, the serial number, is that it should be a 64-bit number, but it should be a positive integer. So that means if you use normal C variables, half the numbers are negative. Now, what they meant was interpreted as positive, so they're all two to the 64, but what people actually wrote the code for many things is they take a 64-bit random number and then they change the last bit to always be zero, so it's positive. So there really are only 63 bits randomness. The left bit is always zero. Now, I don't know why anybody thinks this matters. Two to the 63 is not immensely different than two to the 64, but it turns out technically, because several popular libraries have been doing this for years, Thousands of TLS certificates are technically not in compliance with the standard, and everybody is canceling them and reissuing them if you get 64 bits in the serial number, which, you know, anyway. Uh, it's, this is the problem. This is why people hate compliance. Compliance often means you spend a lot of work doing something, so you now adhere to the standard, when in fact it doesn't really matter. But anyway, um, that's where we're at. Um, I... The U.S. actually did something right and bipartisan, or they haven't done it yet. I mean, this, I assume this will be vetoed somewhere because this is some, but they're trying to pass rules for Internet of Things security. And apparently it's got through both Congress and Senate have done this and both parties have done it. 
And it just says simple things like you shouldn't be allowed to have a default password on your IoT thing uh, you want, and things like that. And you have to do this by 2020 um, formal recommendations. You will have to make recommendations with, and revise the rules every five years and have just some basic security rules for Internet of Things devices. It, I find it very hard to believe this will really happen because for like 10, 15 years, they haven't passed any cybersecurity laws that make the slightest sense because nobody can agree about them. Um, but anyway, we'll see. Uh, if they actually do something right. So the 737, two of these planes crashed. Um, and so Boeing tried to say, everything's fine, don't worry about it. And ever, uh, then in, many other, Singapore said they're not using them. China said they're not using them. Yesterday, the UK said they're not going to use them. And, at, and this is almost all of Boeing's product line. They have 6,000 outstanding orders, 5,000 of them are this plane. So this single problem could collapse Boeing and their stock has fallen by, I think, 50%. I was thinking maybe I should buy some. Um, but... It's, um, anyway, this is pretty awesome. And the thing I'm wondering is this must be snarling up air traffic around the world. If a whole bunch of planes aren't flying that should be flying at major hubs, it's going to back up everything. I'm glad I'm not flying anywhere this week. I bet you can't fly anywhere without being hours late. You can't just choke. It's like a bad storm. When you choke off a significant number of flights somewhere, everything backs up everywhere. Everybody misses all their connections. Anyway, um, so... Madness going, and it's still not clear whether it's really their fault. I mean, I would just get on one and not worry about it because there's thousands of them flying every day. Two of them fell down. Even if there's something wrong, the risk is relatively small. But, you know, people have this thing about dying. It bothers them. Um, anyway, uh, say so don't do security analysis, right? Risk analysis. You could die anyway, and pretty soon you will. So, anyway, that's, that's how I see it. Anyway, uh, so this one I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, if you take a um, Microsoft a file name in something, so you put on, um, I forget exactly how you put the file name in here, but in the file name, you put, oh, you make a registry change. Okay, you make, you know, as you probably know in Windows, you can make a registry change and you can save a reg file. And then when you double click the reg file, it will change the registry. And you can do awesome things with that. Change the system settings, turn off the firewall, you know, all kinds of important security things can be done with these reg files. But it pops up a box saying, this file is attempting to change the registry, is that okay? That's the idea. So that would be fine, but you can change the name of the file to include these special characters like percent %l and percent %i and percent %c and all this jazz. And if you do, you can confuse the visual display of that box. So it says the wrong thing. So it says, click here to win a free iPad instead of, do you want to make this registry change or something like that? And he said, you know, you can totally make them see, make them click yes instead of no. You can change the, the text in that box which would seem like a problem, but Microsoft said they don't care. This doesn't matter. They're not going to patch it at all. So that's good, clean fun. So I, 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 should, I haven't seen a proof of concept, but it would be fun to have something that does something horrible and says win a free iPad or something. Pretty soon that'll be out if it's not out already. It sounds really easy to do. Just make a file with a name like that. I haven't tried it, but it looks pretty promising. Anyway, um, so... This guy I've been following, a French hacker, he's a big hit. He did the Donald dating apps, and he did the M. Adhar app, which is in this class. He hacked the Indian app. He's done several hacks of the Indian app. Anyway, so he did the Donald dating app, and he found that um, this, oh, well, conservative news site. This is another one. Anyway, um, this is, oh, they, yeah, the, this is uh, the equivalent. He, he's going through the right-wing Donald Trump fan apps. So a bunch of people are trying to exploit the Trump fanatics by having special apps just for them. And a bunch of them are just idiots, as you might imagine. And so this guy had a special form of Yelp where you would rate. She, remember there was this restaurant that kicked somebody out, like Sarah Sanders or something, for being a right wing? And all the right wing got mad. How dare you do that? So they're going to have a Yelp just for that. Like, are right wingers welcome in this place? And which sounds like it might even be slightly sensible. But anyway, it turns out that their app is horrible, like the University of Houston one I showed you a couple of weeks ago, to where not only can you hack into the app, but the API has no authentication. So you can just request everybody's name and address and password and everything from the server, and it will just hand it over, just like the University of Houston was doing. And so he told them, and when he told them, they're totally blaming him and, and accusing him and going to turn him into the FBI and threaten him and everything else and your rotten bomb and not admitting there's a problem and they have to fix it at all. And what's funny is he wrote exactly what I wrote to Houston. I did not hack your app. Uh, please don't hurt me. And they didn't take it right. <laughs> but he didn't find somebody over the other end of this that's running cyber competitions, which is what I would have recommended. But there probably is nobody in the Donald dating app that is doing cyber competitions, unfortunately. That's why I kind of like colleges, because there's a chance that they're actually in CCDC or something. And therefore, there is somebody that will understand what I'm talking about. 
which is, that totally works. But this is what you usually get when you, well, usually they just ignore you. But if they pay attention, they just say, you're an evil hacker, you're hacking us, lock this guy up, and that'll fix the problem. So anyway. Um, all right. And there is a thing called the California Consumer Privacy Act. This is news to me. Apparently, it's a lot like the European one. And uh, Microsoft has special software you can get intended for Europe and now be used here because apparently both California and Europe now have all these rules where you have to um, measure what kind of data you're storing. You have to have a process to respond to data subject requests because you are allowed to ask them what your data is on you. And therefore, they have to have some kind of system to respond efficiently to those. You have to have some way to protect the data and label it. And you have to have some way to encrypt the emails about it. And you have to have, you know, there's a bunch of requirements like Europe. So we'll see what happens. Another one I don't see here, but I believe it's part of the European law is the right to be forgotten. The customer is allowed to demand that you delete the data about them. And, you know, until like a year ago, all the tech giants were united in saying, oh, no, that's impossible. We can't write code like that. That would cost too much. And now they're saying, well, okay, fine. That's what I said. When you make them do it, they'll do it. And then they can't say they don't have it. Let's say just use the European version over here, which is what's beginning to happen. Although the tech giants are, in fact, strongly pushing for federal privacy regulations so that they can escape this California law. They want to have a weaker federal law, which will trump it. And although that may seem evil, it is kind of logical because if there were 50 different state laws, then how could you run a business at all? But we'll see what happens. Anyway, um, all right. This huge cheating scandal is over the place. All kinds of people are paying money. And the thing I heard on NPR this morning, which I thought was pretty good, is everybody already knew this. You buy the new library, you give them money, your kids get in. They even have an official policy called keeping the family together and inheriting your seat and everything. I, the only thing about this is they were bribing and falsifying things, whereas the other people just do it openly. This is why buildings are named after people. Uh, it's Anyway, people are getting really mad. But if you think about it, this is really not even exactly news. <laughs> They're just doing it in a more crooked way, the same thing that other people do all the time. Well, well, you know, they, a bunch of them are going to prison, apparently. They don't, they don't want to, yeah. they don't want to investigate Trump, so they find something else to do. Well, yeah. Well, anyway. Um, so let's take a look at the latest chapter, which is the first third of chapter eight. And I think it won't take very long because uh, a lot of it was already done. But anyway, this is, continues to be very interesting stuff about Android internals. So we'll talk about Android implementation issues. And um, so I broke it into three pieces and I recorded the pages and everything here. So this first third of it, and there's the second third, and there's the last third. So it'll be three chapters and three quizzes, three lectures and three quizzes. And so uh, the first thing is the pre-installed apps. And here is where I actually have a real Android tablet, and I'm thinking of buying a couple more because these emulators only go so far. And also at the um, B-Sides, there was a hands-on workshop for Android malware, and she said, you have to run your malware in a real phone. All the malware identifies emulators, and it won't run there. So, you know, that's about time for me to buy some Android devices. You can get cheap ones for like 40 bucks. And especially if you're doing malware or trying to find them to be lousy, cheap ones are probably better because they'll make more stupid mistakes. That's why I got the one I got. The one I got was famous about two years ago as being the worst insecure one you could get. And I got it just to check it out. And I never bothered playing with it until recently. But theoretically, it's got Android debugging turned on by default and all sorts of horrible things. So, um, all right, so each installed app has its own attack service. We've been here at its exported intents and exported activities and such. Um, if you were to exploit an app and get privileges of that app, you would not have root necessarily, but you often would, you might have enough to do what you want to do, like exfiltrate the data from that app or from other apps with the same signature. And another thing you could do is you could try to find powerful apps to exploit. Some apps have more power than others. For example, some apps have install packages, which means they can install more malware on the phone. That would be pretty awesome. Uh, but it turns out, of course, this is now defined by the Android package and its signature or system, so a normal app cannot get this permission, which is probably a good idea. The only apps that can get this permission are apps that are from Google, essentially, part of the system. Um, so that's that's how, so you would have to find, this is the same thing in Microsoft Windows. It's pretty easy to find some kind of app you run on Windows or the phone. It's very hard to get into Windows, the operating system itself, because everyone has hunted those to death. Microsoft worked hard on patching that stuff. And so in order to get this privilege, you would have to find a component of Android that is broken. And that does happen, but it's a higher bar. The apps in the Google Play typically do not have this permission because they're going to run with just like user, user 0101, user 0102. 
because they're not part of the system. They're an inch in the lab. Yeah, and they won't have this permission. This permission can only be had by Android package, which is part of the operating system, or something signed with the same certificate. And the whole idea is that means nobody can make these apps except Google. So anybody that is not Google should not be able to get this permission. Unless they are business partner of Google so much that Google actually chooses to sign their app for them, if they might. I know um, Microsoft will kind of do that. If you send Microsoft a driver for your hardware, you can pay them a fee and they will certify your driver. That's why you get a box that says design for Windows 7, design for Windows 10 on a keyboard or something. That means they actually sent the driver to Microsoft and Microsoft validated it was good and then they build it into the operating system and treat it as an operating system component. So there might be some similar partnership deal with Google, I'm not sure. But if you just write an app and put it in the store, you're not gonna be in this category. So almost no apps in the store, I would think, are in this category, although it would actually be an interesting thing to down to check all the apps in the store and see what their signatures, what their permissions are. You often find interesting things that way. In 2014, the computer emergency response team scanned all the apps in the Play Store at that time and checked them for SSL vulnerabilities and found, you know, like 15% of them had it, found like 20,000 vulnerable apps, automatically notified them. Uh, it is actually pretty easy and the kind of thing academics do is, you know, get a grant and then scan all the apps in the store for something and publish some report about the general level of security uh, what I learned from that, which has led me to where I am now with this Android stuff, is that a manual test is much, much better than those automated tests. Because I found a bunch of phones they didn't find in that 2014 study, and I thought, sure, it was pretty, but you know, I didn't do 80,000 apps a year. I did like 100 apps, but a bunch of them were, were vulnerable, even though that test didn't pick it up. So, um, also, a lot of things they rated as vulnerable were not really vulnerable. That's another problem. They technically had an error in that some packets went over an HTTPS connection with the wrong certificate, but if you actually look at the app, the data that was sent was not important. And when they get to the important stuff, they validated it. So they, that's a false positive. I think that's a very bad thing. When you tell someone they have a problem and there's really no problem, then they just hate you. This is what I thought, you security guys are idiots, so I'm just gonna ignore everything you say. You know, This is, I think parents, to try to convince their kids to do what they should, like go to bed and brush their teeth, have the same problem. If you're actually wrong, and you shove them around, now they hate you more than ever, <laughs> and they'll ignore everything you say. Anyway, on an emulator, you find almost nothing with this permission. You can run this thing, run app package list with the permission, install packages, and you see the only thing on there is Google Play itself, and uh, Android Shell, and a package installer. All these are the only, and they're all part of Android or Google products. So those are the only things that have this permission on my emulator. However, in the book, he ran this on a real Samsung device, and there were 66 things with this permission, which is the same thing you'd find if you buy a Windows laptop. The Windows operating system is fine, but if you get like an HP laptop, they get the HP backup, the HP photo thing, the HP printer driver, the HP photo garbage album. That stuff is all garbage. It crashes the machine, and it's all terribly insecure. So the actual product you buy has a whole bunch of extra things, like why does the wallpaper backup have things is running a system. You know, this is, a, this is the thing about open source software. You can totally modify Android and totally subvert security models. So that's why I think I need to get some real devices. Real devices have all kinds of vulnerabilities you don't find in emulators. Because the emulators are just running the stock uh, Android straight from Google. And that's like you get a Windows install disk and install Windows. This is something I had a discussion with Kirk years ago. You install a fresh version of Windows, he says, there, go ahead and hack it. And I said, you know, you really can't hack that because that has nothing but the natural Microsoft software, and that stuff is pretty good. But real servers have got app on app, custom app, stuff five years out of date. That's how people get in. If you actually use something for a couple of years, it's all full of junk, and now there's a way in. Anyway, so, um, all right, so the remote attack vectors are things you can do from the outside. I see a chat message, if I can get my computer to show it to me. Okay, where do you suggest we get cheap Android phones? It's a very good question, and I really don't know. Shopping's not my long shoot. Well, I'm figuring I'm just gonna go online and Google like Android phones. And, and um, I, the person that taught the Malware Analysis Workshop said just a $40 cheap Android phone will do. Um, I, my tablet I got at home is running Android 4.2. I think I might go for something a little more modern than that, but a lot of apps run on it, so it's, um, I couldn't run the one app I really cared about on it, but I might be able to run more. I, I would, Say, first, just get whatever you can get cheap, like something somebody's upgrading and discarding. I don't know. I know nothing. 
But I'll let you know, I'm probably gonna buy a few, by the end of the class, I'll probably have some tests on real devices up here. We can compare real devices to the emulator and all the pros tell me, real developers, they say, have a whole pile of real devices because you can't really write an app and have it any good if you use emulators. They're not good enough. You have to have real phones to test it on or your app will not really work very well. So that's the next level, is get a, a box of real devices. Anyway, so um, ways to take over the phone from the outside. If you don't have any foothold on it at all, the obvious one is trick the user into installing a malicious app. That's ridiculously easy. You can put malware in the Play Store and they won't catch you. You can email them a link or something. Uh, on the server side, um, a server side attack would be to actually find a listening port on the phone and send a message to it which causes a buffer overflow or something and takes over. That's how you take over servers. And a client side is where you get them to run some local client software on something like send an email attachment or something and they open it. Um, so the uh, browsers are often vulnerable, things like PDF readers and such. Uh, so this is the same as it is on Windows or any other desktop operating system. Uh, you'll find a whole series of vulnerabilities and things like PDF readers, flash players, and um, unzip utilities. And so you, um, Samsung had one of these. They had a thing called Polaris Viewers or PDF installed by default. My emulator has no PDF reader at all. You can run this uh, Drozer command to find things that have the ability to open PDF and it doesn't find it. Um, but on well, Samsung included something and it turned out to have a vulnerability just like Adobe PDF reader does. And so you could send someone a PDF and when they open it, you take over their phone. Um, Browsable activities are activities that can open from a URL. So you can make a URI with a special scheme and it goes in here. So that's called browsable. This is quite common. People like to do it because it's easy to call something from the outside like Skype did this. In the famous case, the Skype colon slash slash phone number would make a Skype call. So you could now put a Skype link on the web page, click it and make a phone call. But unfortunately, they didn't put any prompt to warn you, so you could make an iframe on a web page that loads a Skype URL, and now people make phone calls without meaning to. And so that's why the upgrade was to make Android so it always warns you before making a phone call. It pops up a box to tell you so it doesn't do it without your permission. And so uh, you know, if you have a rogue Drozer agent, which um, we're going to talk about tonight, and the project should be making them pretty soon, um, then you could define this in your manifest file, you define an activity and you give it an intent filter and the intent filter defines a scheme cone and a permission browsable. So now it is going to listen for URIs that begin with pwn. And if they do, it will catch them and send them here. That's how it works. And this is no longer permitted in an iframe, but it is if you click on a link or take some user action, you can send an intent with this URI and it will then run this permission. I'll run that activity. So you can make ahref pwn me start Drozer or ahref intent uh, with either an intent or just the reference to a URI with pwn in it. You can launch that item. All right. Uh, so it turns out I ran the browsable filter on my emulator and I got like 10 pages of stuff. I've installed like 30 or 40 apps just to test them. And there were a lot of them. The Fidelity app is listening the uh, messaging app, the Blackboard app for Berkeley College is listening. You know, many, many things have defined. This apparently is really popular to catch these URIs. So that might be an interesting thing to explore further. Um, all right, then this is kind of horrible. I noticed before the thing that got all the military colleges in trouble is that they don't use the default browser. Instead, they write their own browser inside their app and write it wrong. So here's another thing, which is what got Apple, where they are. Apple used, to, five years ago, Apple used to have five reasons to buy a Mac, and number one was no malware. And then Apple decided to mess with the updates. So they had um, Flash or Java, I think it was Flash, on the Mac. And I think it was Java. You know, Java always bugs you. Every single time you boot it up, it says Java might have an update. Apple didn't like that. So they blocked that update and replaced it with the Apple update. So it would only remind you every six weeks instead of harassing you every day. So everybody's Java was six weeks out of date, so somebody wrote Java malware and infected all these Macs with Java, and they had to take that off their bullet list. Now there's malware on the Mac because they messed with the update. So, and not to be outdone, Android people are doing the same thing. They don't settle for whatever the default update is. Because it will warn you, Google Play has found some updates for your app, you should go update them. If you don't want to doing that, you can put a custom update mechanism inside your app. 
And this is like putting a browser inside your app. You have now taken on a responsibility that if you were a more careful thinker, you'd probably realize you don't really want this responsibility. Now you are saying, I'm going to fetch code from the web and install it on the phone automatically. And I'm sure I can do that safely, more as safe as Google Play. And I say, I'm not so sure. So you can do it, but your code could easily be vulnerable. You might be fetching it over HTTP instead of HTTPS. You might be using broken HTTPS and so on. Um, if you, you're, it's very unlikely that you as an app developer actually know how to do this right. So that's a wide open door. Um, and here's something even more mind boggling. In, this is from the Android documentation. There's this thing called Dex Class Loader so that you can load code in your app after it's running and run it. It's like a remote code execution right there for you. You would load classes from a JAR or APK file, including on other, on other storage devices, including over the network, and then run them. Like, thank you. This is how Drozer works. This is why you can send commands to Drozer and they run on your phone. Drozer is just listening for commands over the network and running anything that comes in. This is, this is what Java used to do. That's why um, long ago, like three or four years ago, all the way back for 15 years ago, browsers had Java clients in them. And Java had a feature called just take over remote control of the device. It was just a feature. It was not a bug. So you could just totally take over any PC anytime with Java malware. I did it all the time in my 123 class, and nobody ever fished it because it was not a bug. They had an option, take over the phone, take over the device. And it was just mind-boggling. And that's what this looks like to me. Anyway, um, so they do warn you, uh, you know, don't if you're going to be loading code from some external source at runtime, uh, don't load it from somewhere dangerous. But, you know, putting a message like that to a developer is not enough to stop them doing the wrong thing. Because just like everybody, they don't really read this. They just make their app work and then sell it and go on to the next app. Anyway, so you load new code at runtime. That's the Dex class, loader class. And you can use the, here's um, a series of mistakes that lead to this, some fun exploitation we're gonna get to later. But you can have a Java reflection API, which lets you run JavaScript in the browser and the JavaScript can run Java class, which is the native app on the phone. So you can totally, this is like Microsoft ActiveX did the same thing. You could have a web page with code on it, which would run like an installed app on Windows. They used it for Windows Update. You could do a virus scan from a browser, and therefore you can run ransomware from a browser and send emails to a browser and wipe out your hard disk for a browser and just everything. Um, so this is the same kind of thing, uh, asking for code injection vulnerabilities. Web views are the same. This is the list of four mistakes, which when done together, make it wide open. Use a web view. Web views mean you, your app acts as a web browser. Then define a JavaScript interface, which means that JavaScript from the web can run Java locally. Then load from something that someone can manipulate, like plain text or broken HTTPS. And then if you have an older API version, then the defenses aren't there. And now I can get remote code execution on your device from JavaScript. By just getting you to browse to a page, I can do something horrible, like install a new app or take over your phone. So that's good, clean fun, and it'll come up later in this chapter. Um, now your book says, phones don't have any listening ports. So I tried running on an emulator, and I found a whole bunch of listening ports. So that's interesting. I have, like I said, I gotta try more real devices. I, this is open, local OpenGL and local camera. I kind of suspect this is something about how Jenny Motion runs the camera connection, but I don't really know. Um, audio server, read this. There's a bunch of stuff listening on my device. <laughs> Uh, the only one I know is ADB. That's, uh, that part I understand. The rest of these things are kind of disturbing. And obviously, nobody's looking at it because that ES File Explorer just had an open listening port serving up everybody's private picture for years and nobody noticed. So just doing netstat minus P-A-N-T is apparently more than anybody's been doing on Android as a security audit for years. That's why you don't need to be a genius. Just trying for like the top three obvious problems is enough to find a lot of goodies. So um, then, of course, anything else that feeds data in the phone might be a source of attack, like SMS, um, email clients, chat clients, any place where it takes in data, it might handle it unsafely. Um, and if you want to find local vulnerabilities, then you could download every installed app, turn in the source code, scan through them looking for vulnerabilities. This is what I've been doing for years. Um, there, Drozier has scanner modules that sound like they're going to do it. So I tried one. There's a SQL ejection scanner. So I put it, I ran it on my phone that has... Um, it has Civ on it, which is vulnerable to SQL ejection, and it didn't find it. And I must say, this is my experience with all vuln scanners. Vuln scanners sound good until you try them, and they can't find the vuln right in front of them. 
Uh, there was a test about eight years ago where a guy downloaded the top 10 bone scanners, ran them against systems they were designed to run on, and they only find half of what they're supposed to find. Um, Nessus is the best of a, a bad lot, and I'm thinking, I, I, one thing I want to try, I've got so many ideas for projects, I can't do them all. One thing I'd like to do is just run Nessus on the phone. I guess Nessus can probably do Android too, and it might do a better job than Drozer. These Drozer scanners sound good, but when I run them, they don't seem to actually find anything. Nessus usually finds things. Anyway, so you want to exploit a device. Remote exploits reach in from the outside and somehow take it over when I have nothing. So I'm going to have to have malware or a man in the middle attack or something. A local exploit means I already have some ability to execute some limited code on the device. And I'm just trying to find a way to escalate my privileges up to root or system or something. Uh, this turns out to be a fairly easy process. We're doing it in the red versus blue and the 124 and in the cyber competitions. Uh, it is, there are standard ways. To, they're not, it turns out there are an endless chain of kernel exploits. Ultimately, you need a kernel exploit to move up, and new ones are found for every operating system about three months. So if you don't update your stuff every month, there's probably a known way to escalate from local to root. All right. And so then there's attack tools. Edercap is the venerable man in the middle attack. What this does is it sends out bogus ARC replies. So it reroutes traffic on the local area network to go through you. And then it changes DNS addresses to force all the traffic to go through your machine again. And that's what usually does it. Uh, a Windows tool that does the same thing is Kane. And this, and we're testing for the vulnerabilities that could be exploited this way by just using um, local proxy settings to go through BERT. But if you wanted to do it in the real world and attack somebody, you would use art poisoning to get in the middle, and then you'd use these other tools. Um, Burp, of course, we use all the time. You know what this does. It lets you see traffic and modify it, and it can put up fake TLS certificates. So if you have added your Burp as a trusted certificate authority, or if the app does not validate certificate authorities, then you can even do HTTPS man in the middle with Burp. And of course, it was quite powerful and used to just, uh, find holes in servers and in clients for network connections. Now, the book talks extensively about this glorious ability to put Python scripts in Burp, and it is complete garbage. I spent most of this afternoon trying to make it work. You go here and you download the Python scripter Burp extension, which says you can now write Python code inside Burp. And I say, yeah, sure you can. You have to install a thing called um, Py, Phy, Jy, Jython, a Java interface of Python, which works. <laughs> But what totally doesn't work is the script. If you just take the examples they give you and paste them in, they don't work at all. It's appalling. I was able to make one line that says print one work. I was able to make one more thing work very rarely. What happens is this is the most cruel, useless Python environment in the world. You write script. It doesn't work. You don't see an error message or anything. So you're much better off just writing in the command line. And I don't understand what value burp has. In principle, you can write a burp option that will do something like add malware and everything goes through burp or something. But you can just write your own burp request. So you do it in 124, it's in the Violet Python book. I find this to be just a, like torturing yourself for no reason. Writing Python in an environment where you don't even get error messages, so you can't tell what you're doing. It's just uh, exercise in self-abuse. Yeah? Writing code is one of those from burp. Yes, as far as I can tell, there's no added value from BERT, and it's much, much more difficult to write the code. Just write Python straight up. The thing that is, in fact, worth having, which I think I showed you before in BERT, is the thing that helps you write Python code outside BERT. So I run BERT, and then I'll, uh, let's get a project going here. I can, I can actually show you the joy of this BERT module. Um, let's bring BERT back. Here, BERT. Okay, there's BERT. And so I'm going to um, go to my proxy, turn off intercept, and go to my browser and run it through Burp. So it is, oh, I have this pro proxy proxy thing now. So I can go use Burp. Okay. So now uh, this thing is going through Burp. So if I go to an unencrypted page, ad.samsglass.info, and refresh it, and go to history, you will see nothing. That's not good. Okay. Um, well, let's go in one of these pages. Uh, See if I can get anything to work. Okay, there we go. Okay, so I've asked, or sent a request to my server and it's gone into Burp. Now, what you can do, um, there's two useful extensions here. If you go to extender and then BAP store, you can put on all these apps. And I have put on two of these apps and uh, the two that are worth having um, are here copy as Python request. The Python scripter is the one your book 
dedicate several pages to, which is totally worthless. This one is very useful. Copy as Python requests. So if I go to proxy history and I see this request and I say, I would like to do more requests like that, I can right click and copy as requests. And now I can get out of BERT and go to like just a command line. Let me get rid of this one. I'm not using it anymore. Okay. And now I can do pi, uh, like nano foo dot pi and put it in. And it now writes the code that does that request in Python. And now I can just write the code around it to put a loop or modify it or something. This is going to send exactly that stuff to, to the server. Import request and use the request library to send it up. So that is very handy. That I find useful. This other one, I can show you the joy of it. Um, so this other one I put on and spent hours trying to make it work. After you install it, you now have a thing called scripts. And you can put scripts here. So if you put in this script, print one. Now, every time Bert does a request, it's going to execute that command also. So if I go to this page and click on something, okay, it just sent a request of some kind to my server. And so if I go back to Bert, I can go to... Um, one of these things, yeah, extender, Python scripter, output. It's putting out ones. So the print one works. Now they'll give you examples. I found ones on the web and ones in the book with maybe 20 lines that are supposed to do things like add alert one. They totally don't work because something is wrong with them, like a missing comma or a tab, and you don't get any error messages. There's an errors tab here, which is just a cruel joke. The errors don't go there. You'll some errors go there, 90% of the errors don't go there. The errors are just gone. So you're trying to write code and you can't see the error message. You might as well just close your eyes and try to write code. Why would you do this to yourself? You could just write in a Python environment, like idle or something. Coders have learned long ago, you don't write code when you can't see what you're doing. Not unless you're incredibly cruel to yourself. So anyway, um, and, and when you're all done, if you somehow overcome these enormous obstacles, all you've got is a, code, a script that runs automatically when you have a burp request. So why didn't you just write the whole thing in Python, <laughs> copy the requests, and do whatever you want in Python? Apparent, I think the point of this is to try to somehow take people that don't know Python and convince them that they can customize BERT without learning Python, but Python is not that hard. So anyway, you know, really, you don't hardly need anything in BERT if you don't learn a little Python. It's doing very simple things. Anyway, so I think there are certain people that are afraid of code and they imagine that they can do things here. The only possible use of that I can imagine is you could write that and then give it to somebody else and they could just run it. But you could just write a Python script and give it to them. Anyway, so I was not impressed. The author of your book thinks that thing is awesome. I'm not convinced. I couldn't make it do anything other than print one. All the examples that are longer just crash and you can't find the bugs in them. Anyway, so... That's torture. Then there's Drozer. Now when you're using Drozer in a simple mode where you put an agent on the phone and run it and now you can send commands there. There's, this is Drozer. If you used Metasploit, you will notice Drozer is just a direct copy of Metasploit. Metasploit does the same thing for general operating systems like Windows. It has a whole series of attacks. Drozer is like a small, limited, uh, Android-specific version of Metasploit. And it has the other features Metasploit has. Metasploit lets you create malware. You run it on a Windows box or something, and then you run a command and control server. So Drozer has a command and control server option. You can run a Drozer server, which is like a Metasploit uh, handler. Then you can make a rogue agent, which is malware, put it on the phone or push it onto the phone with vulnerability, and then it will phone home with a remote shell back to this. By the way, you can also do all of that in Metasploit. Metasploit can make Android malware. And so I got to add that. Those are projects I want to add to the class. So I think that's important enough. I probably will put it in there. How to take over phones the same way you take over Windows and Linux and Mac by just making malware in Metasploit. Or perhaps in Drozer, which amounts to about the same thing. So, all right. Then there's privilege levels. The last bit here. Um, here's the privilege levels available on Android. If you have a web browser and you gain some degree of code execution, uh, what you often get is uh, non-system app without context, which means you can execute some commands in that app, but you cannot access Java libraries from inside the app. And what that means is you don't have what's called a context. So it turns out you can navigate the file system and see the files, but you can't really launch very many commands. There's a very limited shell. You don't even have the full privileges of that app. And that app is probably not root. So this is the minimal level of control of your device. Um, you can't install packages, you can't read SMS, because those are involved using Java libraries. The next step would be to gain context. 
This is where you actually can break into the app's execution flow and now run things with the full power of that app. So if it's a browser, like uh, then you have the power of the browser. Um, so you get the context and now you can do anything the app can do. So you can reach anything, directory it can reach. You can, if the app has read SMSs, you can read SMSs and so on. Then installed packages. If you're able to install a package and own that package, now when you're installing, you can ask for permissions like dial the phone, read the SMS and access the camera and the microphone. And if the user clicks yes, then you have those permissions. You can get new permissions that might not have been in the thing you originally exploited. That's why it's real good to exploit something with install per, uh, packages permission and then follow it up with another package so you can get more permissions if the user is dumb enough to click on that box. Or you find one of the many bugs where you're allowed to get permissions that the user didn't really authorize. Then there's ADB shell, which is what we're using in here. You type ADB shell, you have commands on there, and now you can install apps and run quite a, and you act as a developer on the phone. And then system user is the next level up, running as system. Uh, that is the permission that lets you install apps, and you can now change the device configuration and get in everybody's directory. But there's an even higher level, the king is always root on Linux. And root now can read and write directly to RAM. So you can steal data from RAM, which is not, which is a direct device access. This is kernel level access, which you don't have uh, at any of the other levels. And of course, they can do anything less than that too. So those are the many general levels of power you can have on Android. Yeah, I got some cahoots about that. And that's it for this. Um, I should, uh, before I do the cahoots, I just want to make sure I remember to tell you this. Uh, let me turn off my proxying, which I can do here. Okay. And uh, the projects. People were getting confused about the projects, so I tried to change the layout to make it less confusing. <laughs> See if I can get this garbage to work. Okay. Um, so only the first bit is different for Mac and Windows. By the end of the first six projects, you should have an emulator of some kind running as root, another emulator that is not root, and the ability to run ADB shell on one of them. And then you can run Drozer on one of them, and then you can do everything else after that. So you have to use the right one down here. Typically, the right thing to do is use Jenny Motion on a Mac or use Nox on Windows. That is typically how you move forward. Um, Kirk was the one determined to use Jenny Motion on Windows, and I think he managed to get it to Project 8 by doing heroic, insane things, and, he, and then you have to pretty much give up. You made it too? It turns out that the problem is Jenny Motion has customized the um, VirtualBox libraries and still have the other emulators, so they really don't let you do the full VirtualBox networking, so you really have to suffer. Nox, there's two ways to use Nox on Windows. One is to have two physical Windows machines because Knox grabs the VirtualBox emulator, and if you're running a VirtualBox Kali, it can't see it. So one is to use two physical machines, which is the way I wrote the project. The other is to run VMware for Kali, and, ver and then Knox, which is VirtualBox. But anyway, it's not as easy on Windows, but it can be done. And if you can get Android Debug Bridge and Drozer running, then you can do all this stuff. So all these should run. Another thing I really want to make sure and tell you about, which several students were suffering greatly about, including Mirabelle there, is I learned What's going, several, I have had the project work and it would fail for other students, and I think the progressive is one. I finally caught on. We're using these hacking tools, and these hacking tools are uh, APK tool. There we are. APK tool, it turns out that some apps you have to use one version of APK tool, and other apps you have to use another. And at first I thought the ones that give you obvious error messages and crash are the bad ones, but even that is not true. For example, one of these projects, you can use APK tool 234, and it does not give you an error message, but it doesn't work. You have to use 2.3.3, which also gives you no error message and works. I don't know what's going on with the development of these tools, but it seems even more haphazard than most hacking tools, although Kali is similar. Every single time they update Kali, they break a whole bunch of things without knowing it. And Metasploit, by the way, is also similar. And here's another fun one I just hit yesterday, today, this morning. I was running APK tool on an app, and it wouldn't decompile, and so I tried all these advanced switches, and then I, it gave me an error message, it gave me a clue, you have to run it on 64-bit Kali. It calls itself the same version, but it only works on 64-bit Kali, not on 32-bit Kali. For almost any modern activity, you really want to be on a 64-bit Kali. The 32-bit Kali is increasingly being left in the dust. Libraries and other apps are not really updated. So this is the world of hacking. Guys, I'm sorry about it. We're using broken stuff to break in things, and it never gets better than like a beta version. So here's how you get an old version of APK tool. I went to 
find them on there. You can download that particular version. Now, the built-in APK tool, you can just type APK tool, and that will be the pre-compiled version in Kali, and that's whatever is determined by your Kali version. But if you want to control the version, you have to get the jar file, and then from now on, you don't just type APK tool, you type Java minus jar, and then the specific version. And this is how you could have multiple versions on the same machine and use them. So be aware, um, this is the level of suffering some people will have, especially Windows users. Uh, check the APK tool version and make sure you're using 64 bit system. And that's just, and it's pretty much just, oh, another thing I just found out right before class. I was doing the same app like 10 times and suddenly it said Google Play Protect is blocking the app, which also happened to Maribel. And I found out what happened. Google Play Protect scans your phone on some periodic basis. So you're using it and it's fine. Then the hour is up and it scans and decides your malware and blocks it from then forward. So this is good, clean fun. It's not in my project instructions because it never happened to me until this morning. But now I finally understand why it happened to a few students and not others. So let me bring up my phone and point this out. Uh, this I'm gonna have to have like a, uh, a special thing at the start of the project full of like debugging tips because these are weird things which explain why many students are suffering greatly. Because um, I do it and it works fine and many students it works and a bunch of them it fails for no good reason. Here's a few of those reasons. Um, and so I'll, you have to turn off Google Play Protect, which is like Windows Defender. And it is so screwy that it doesn't work all the time. You can be using your phone for a long time with it turned on and it will suddenly decide to scan and decide not to let you do things. So you turn it off here, settings, and then um, it was security and Google Play Protect is here. It's very much like Windows Defender. I turned it off. If you leave it on, it will regularly scan your device. So the project will work for a while until Play Protect scans it, and then it will refuse to let you install apps anymore that aren't signed by known developers. So that'll be somewhere. This is a thing to know. If you're being driven nuts, turn that off there. You will see an error message saying, uh, this signature was not recognized, you can't put things on. Anyway, I saw another chat message come in. Um, okay, I'm suffering every day. ADB refuses to work from Kali. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I've used every modern version of Kali, and it works on both 32 and 64. Um, it's probably networking. Try pinging end-to-end. -end. You can also install ADB natively on your host. That's how we did it the first time I taught this class. You can put ADB right on Windows. You can put ADB right on the Mac and not use Kali at all. Um, the easiest way to do that is to just install uh, Android Studio. But you can also install just the ADB command line version and run directly from the host OS. I just decided to stick with Kali because I thought it would be easier for most students, but uh, that's an option. Anyway, um, if you bring your machine to the lab or, or turn on some kind of remote viewer, I can help you do it too. Um, you should be able to get ADB working one way or another. Okay, but try those, good. Anyway, uh, you don't need a cellular carrier. Uh, no, I don't think you need a cellular carrier to do this kind of test. You can just connect with USB and with Wi-Fi to test like malware on an Android phone. Uh, some malware might actually use the cellular connection and you won't be able to see that, but for what we're doing here, I don't think you need to pay for cellular connection to have a phone to do the projects with. Anyway, I will start using a real phone soon and I'll talk about that. Um, I haven't done it myself, but I'm increasingly convinced that is the next step. Yeah. I don't know. I don't have any real experience. So I'm, I'm just using a cheap one. Uh, I start by just getting a cheap one because I don't know any better. Okay. Um, is it possible to save settings for free Burp Suite? I think it is. There's a thing right when you first launch Burp where it says, do you want to load a profile? I'm not sure if it's possible to save settings or not. I never have tried. Um, it may be that they charge for that. It's a good question and I don't know the answer. Um, all right. Anyway, so those are a few, I guess we're down to cahoots. Anyway, I wanted to make sure and mention some things about the project because some people are suffering for fairly good reason. You can totally be following my instructions and have it not work. Uh, sorry about that. But the thing you understand is this is combat, what we're doing. This is not normal development under normal safe conditions. We're doing combat. And, you know, the military will tell you no, uh, no plans survive contact with the enemy. And 
people are turning on security features, the malware people are upgrading things. It, that's why it's never going to be reliable. Um, wait, I don't think I have these up here. I think I forgot to put them up there. I wrote them, and then I forgot to put them up, so they're not going to be tonight. All right, no cahoots today. Sorry about that. I'll bring them next time. I got distracted trying to hack into an app. I've been spending all day trying to hack into an app. I think I've almost found the certificate pinning, but I didn't quite get there. Anyway, all right. Well, I guess that's enough of this. I'm going to stop the share and go upstairs and help anyone who wants to work on projects, and I'll have the cahoots next time. Any other questions? All right, I'm going to stop it and go upstairs and see what I can do to help.